This is part 2 of my video about the worst decades in Roman history. Part 1 covers the earlier periods, like the Roman Republic and the Western Empire. And this one is entirely about the Byzantine period. If you want a full list, you should watch part 1 first. The link to it should be on your screen. So with introductions out of the way, let's go ahead to our next entry. Do you like any of the following? Bubonic swellings as large as melons in the groin and in the armpits. Entering coma, sleeping for days, memory loss, hallucinations and lunacy, black pustules all over your body, vomiting blood, dying in agony. If the answer is no to all of the above, I'd advise you not to time travel to Constantinople in 540s AD. Because from 541 to 549, the plague of Justinian was ravaging the capital, and these were just some of its symptoms. But you had first-hand experience with pandemics, haven't you? You are going to take your chances. Well, if you're one of the lucky 3 out of 5 people to actually survive the first outbreak of the plague, you might find these new aspects of everyday life discomforting. Piles of dead bodies in the streets. A soup of decomposing flesh in the harbor. Stench of rotting corpses covering the city. Famine. And, unrelatedly, three different earthquakes. If you're looking for a place other than the capital to wait out the plague, I have to warn you that the countryside isn't much safer. And you should also keep in mind the war with Persia in the east, where Antioch has just been brutally sacked. And the war with Ostrogoths, which laid waste to much of Italy. This period is especially tough because I've erased most of the work done in the previous decades. You were just celebrating the restoration of imperial rule in Italy, when suddenly everything is falling apart. Horrific urban scapes of plague-ridden cities must have felt like the end times. I actually think that this was the worst decade in the wider Roman history, in terms of how pivotal it was. There are other strong contenders for this title, but 540s take the cake in my opinion. Early 600s were no walk in the park either. The plague still makes occasional appearances, like in 599 and 607, but it's no longer a main threat to your well-being. For the political elite with any connection to the Justinian dynasty, that would be the purchase of the usurper Phocas. For everyone else, it would be the devastating war with Persia. Before the usurpation of Phocas, the Eastern Roman Empire was fairly unaccustomed to violent regime change. So the revolt and the murder of Emperor Maurice and his family must have been a shock for the citizenry of Constantinople. To top that, the Persian Shah Khosrow II took advantage of the instability and invaded the empire, using revenge for Maurice as a pretext. The empire would spend the next two and a half decades in a bitter struggle against the Persians, during which it would find itself on the brink of total destruction on more than one occasion. In 610, Phocas was overthrown by Heraclius. Heraclius would eventually prove himself the savior of the empire, but the immediate consequence of his revolt was the complete collapse of defenses and loss of Roman control over the entirety of the eastern provinces. The Balkans also were unsafe, but threatened by the Avars and the Slavs. In 611, Anatolia was overrun, and in 615, the Persian army could be seen from Constantinople. Because of Heraclius' heroics, the empire would eventually emerge victorious from this war, but it was exhausted to a breaking point. It had no resources left to deal with the Arab invasion that came not a decade after, and would lose key territories that it would never recover. The Arab invasion itself can be also considered one of the toughest periods, but the bulk of the erosion of Roman control of the Middle East was done during the Persian War. Between the previous entry and this one, there are three and a half centuries of ups and downs for the Eastern Roman Empire. It survived through the Arab invasions, Bulgar Wars and the Iconoclasm to emerge into Macedonian Renaissance. But by the second half of the 11th century, the empire's fortunes were once again on the downturn. If your family lived in Anatolia through the last couple of centuries, they might have built something for themselves under the protection of one of the wealthy magnates. Sadly, you were about to lose all of that. For the last half century, the empire hasn't got an emperor with enough ability and time on the throne to deal with the triple threat of Pechenegs, Normans and Turks. In 1071, Romanus Diogenes went east to face the Seljuks. He would only return after Seljuk Sultan released him from captivity on a promise of a hefty ransom. And his return would not be welcomed by all. 
The most depressing thing about being a soldier in this decade is that you were less likely to die by a Turkish arrow than by a sword of your countrymen. Multiple successful and unsuccessful usurpers would try their luck at becoming the emperor of the disintegrating empire. While they fought among themselves, the Seljuks were taking over the cities of Anatolia one by one. The state of the army deteriorated, leading to a near loss of the whole of the Balkans to the Normans. Some of the Anatolian land would be recaptured in the upcoming century, but the Romans would never again be the great power they were before. Another century passed that saw the start of the Crusades and the Komnenian Restoration. Now the Angolid Emperor sits on the throne. His younger brother has been dealing with the Bulgar uprising with pretty mediocre results, and Alexios took this as an opportunity to depose him. Now Isaac, the previous Emperor, is blinded and languishes in prison. Even though Isaac wasn't too impressive, Alexios III turned out to be much worse. He bungled all of his endeavors, and now at the turn of the century, the Empire has no allies and no fleet to speak of. The eastern frontiers re-established under Komnenos dynasty are once again overrun by the Turks, and Balkans are ravaged by the Kingdom of Hungary and the uprising of Bulgarians and Vlachs. Worse still, he let his nephew and Isaac's son, another Alexios, slip out of Constantinople and appeal to the Crusaders for help in taking the throne. In July 1203, the Crusaders entered the city. People tried to convince Alexios to organize the resistance, but he chickened out. He stole as much gold from the treasury as he could transport and fled to Thrace. But even if he didn't steal that gold, his nephew and brother would still have nowhere enough to pay off the crusaders and their Venetian allies. Tensions grew and the Latins became restive. In January 1204, citizens deposed Alexios and Isaac and crowned Alexios Dukas. Negotiations failed and on the 12th of April, crusaders forced their way into the city. The sack of Constantinople is among the worst atrocities of the Middle Ages. Apart from the obvious material damage, it also destroyed any hope for mending the Great Schism. The duplicity, brutality and greed of the Crusaders, the desecration of the holy places by those who claimed to fight in the name of Christ, made the Schism not just a political or theological issue, but personal for all of the Eastern Romans. They were now saying, better the Sultan's turban than the Cardinal's hat, and they meant it. The sack started 57 years of Latin occupation of the capital. If you were lucky to survive it, your best bet would be to flee to Nicaea under the protection of Theodore Lascaris and spend the last years of the decade fending off Seljuks and Latins. The countryside of Thrace was now a battlefield in the war between the Crusaders and the Bulgars, and it provided no safe haven for anyone living there. If you were an inhabitant of the Eastern Roman Empire in 1341, when Emperor Andronicus III died, your expectations of the future might have been modestly optimistic. Sure, the Empire wasn't any kind of superpower, but it recovered from the Fourth Crusade and was relatively stable. The Anatolian possessions were falling to the Turks, but in Europe it still had Macedonia, Epirus and Thrace. The imperial heir presumptive, John V, was only nine years old. But before he comes of age, he can rely on the guidance of a capable minister, John Cantacuzinos. The fact that a few months into his regency, Cantacuzinos was already campaigning, securing treaties and accepting Achaea back into the imperial fold, was very reassuring. All this, however, was not to be. While Cantacuzinos was away from the capital, Empress Anna, the patriarch John Calecas and High Admiral Alexios Apakokas, conspired against the minister, assumed the regency of young John V, and started the civil war. Their agitation turned this conflict to a full-blown class warfare. The poor of the capital, whose conditions worsened with the influx of refugees from Anatolia, rioted against the rich and burned the great palace. A part of it was converted into a prison where wealthy citizens were held on the slimmest of suspicions. The city of Thessalonica for eight years became a communist dictatorship under the regime of a group called the Zealots. Both sides of the civil war appealed for outside help. The Empress pawned off the crown jewels to Venice. Serbian Emperor Stefan Dusan took advantage of Roman infighting and expanded his own empire at their expense. By the end of this civil war, the once mighty Imperium consisted of the former province of Thrace, the city of Thessalonica, and a couple of islands in the Aegean. 
and if you thought that this was the end of the misfortunes, you were in for a cruel surprise. In 1347, the Black Death hit Constantinople. At the peak of the pandemic, it killed 5,000 people a day. Around 40% of the city's population perished in the initial outbreak. The next decade would not be easier. There would be another civil war, and an earthquake in Gallipoli would drive all of the Greek population from this strategic region. When the Greeks returned, they'd find their settlements occupied by the Ottoman Turks, who were not planning on handing them back. The empire would survive another hundred years, but the best it could do from that point was to go down fighting. And that is all for this list. There were other tough times, but the ones I've listed seem to me as having the biggest toll on the general population. I tried to focus less on the territorial losses and more on the overall conditions for those who lived in the empire, and those two do not necessarily coincide. A back and forth slog like the Italian wars of Justinian was much more damaging in this regard than swift Arab takeover of the East. Certain events didn't make the cut because they didn't drag on like those which did. The examples of these are the Gallic sack of Rome and the year of the four emperors. 1453 also didn't make the cut for the aforementioned reasons. Certainly not every civil war is on this list. Some, like Twenty Years' Anarchy, weren't just violent enough. Others just came at more opportune times, like the wars of the Tetrarchy. So the periods that made the list represent very unenviable times to be alive. I sincerely hope none of us would have to live through the times like the ones I've described. If you think that some periods didn't deserve to be on the list, or that I should have picked some others, let me know in the comments. Thanks a lot for watching till the end, and I will see you in the next one.